Check it out. So we, we've been in this series called Raising Them Up, and um, we've been talking for the past, uh, this is our second week, the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about um, the importance of kids in our church. And we've been asking questions about what are we doing as a church to make sure that we present the gospel to our children. We've also been talking about the responsibility of parents in the church and how they play into that role. And, um, and then also encouraging you uh, in, in, in how do you get involved. Because as we said in infant baptism this morning, it's not, it's not just about the parents. It's all about the church. It's a, it's a relationship um, that we're, and we're doing this all together. Uh, but before we jump into our series, I want to take just a second. I want to say happy Mother's Day. Uh, I want to tell you, especially if you're a first-time mother, congratulations. Um, I know I can tell who you are because you look exhausted and tired, and it's all good. You'll get through it, I promise. Um, but happy Mother's Day to all of you. I also know, um, as I say, happy Mother's Day, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of emotions on Mother's Day. And, you know, sometimes we just jump right in and go, happy Mother's Day, and expect everybody to be really happy. And the truth is that Mother's Day is extremely hard for some folks. You know, I mean, you think about all the different scenarios of, of somebody who may have lost their mom, and this is their first year without them, or somebody who hasn't been able to have a child. Are we thinking about that person? Um, or are we thinking about the person who... Um, may have baggage from past experience of giving up a child. Uh, are we thinking about somebody that gave their child over for adoption? Or, or are, we, are we thinking about those things? Are we thinking about the difficulties that people are facing today? What about, what about a mom who lost their daughter? How does, how does Happy Mother's Day sound to them? And so what I want to do today, if, if you ladies would allow me to do this, I want to pray over you as we start. And when I say to ladies, I mean everybody in here. Um, I want to pray over every lady in this church today, regardless of how you view Mother's Day. And I'm, I'm going to ask you, if you would, if you would join me, just, just take a step of courage, if you would join me and stand up today. Just all the ladies, if you don't mind. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for where you are right now and um, on this Mother's Day. Y'all look great today, by the way. You really do. Everybody looks so nice. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, I just want to stop a minute and pray um, for every lady in here right now. I thank you for the gift of moms and, and Mother's Day and the celebrations and infant baptisms and people eating lunches together and getting to spend time with their mom. But I also want to pray right now for a person in here who may just be in extreme pain about their mother. I want to pray for the person who may have lost their mom this year. This is their first year without them. I pray that you give them strength and courage. Um, I want to pray for someone in here who may have lost a child. I, I want you to remind them today through the power of the Holy Spirit that you are there. I ask you to remind them of the kingdom of heaven that is here and that it's coming, Lord, time when we will reunite. I pray for that person right now, Jesus. I pray for the person in here that's had trouble having children. Um, someone that was never able to conceive. Maybe they come here, Lord, and they just need to be... Um, reminded of your love and that you love them. Uh, I ask you to give them hope and encouragement. Remind them of their purpose. Um, I, I pray for the person here who doesn't have a good relationship with their mom. If any of these ladies in here are holding baggage, something that's keeping them from being able to have a good relationship with their mother, I pray for them right now. I pray that they can find healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, I thank you for each and every lady in here. I, I just thank you for their presence. I ask you to walk with them, be close to them, Jesus. Uh, help them to have a good day today, God. Um, I thank you for all of your daughters that have decided to take a stand today and be prayed for. And I pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you, ladies. So there's a lot of different angles that we could hit today when we, um, when we talk about children in the church. Last week we talked about the church's responsibility, and so I thought that today we might talk about the parents' responsibility, especially with having an infant baptism and seeing the vows that Amy and Zach are taking and not to put pressure on them because everybody in here um, who's had a child baptized took the same vows that you promised to raise them in the Lord. And so we're going to look at what I call gospel-centered parenting. And I'm going to say just straight up, I do not have it figured out. Um, I, I, I am pointing to the Bible and what the Bible says. Don't look at me. 
because I am learning. I am a student just like all of you that are parents right now. But we do want to look at what the Bible says about how do we raise our children in the Lord. Because a lot of times I think what we end up doing is we end up putting an enormous amount of pressure on the church to raise our children. So we're like, I will get my kids to church, I will bring them, and the church can teach them about Jesus, and the church will pray for them. But as far as me, I'm going to step back because I'm not comfortable praying with my kids. I don't know how to lead a Bible study at home. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. But I think the problem with that is that we end up putting too much pressure on the church because it's a two-way street. Uh, the, the parents can't do it without the church, but the church can't do it without what? Without the parents, right? I mean, first of all, parents got to get them here, right? You got, you got to bring them here. Don't just drop them off and go home, but you got to get them here. Um, but, but secondly, if there's not a foundation laid at the heart of the home, then none of this stuff in church is really going to take. Because it takes the kids seeing their moms and dads exemplifying what we're teaching in church in order for them to grow up and be mature Christians. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Your responsibility, if you're a parent, if you're in here and you're not a parent, just listen up because we've got a role for you too. Because the whole church took a vow today. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Just take out your Bible. Hope you bring your Bible to church. Hope you bring your phone. Open up your phone app. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's the Old Testament. Help me. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Right? We got it. We're studying our Bibles. Amen? Those are the first five books of the Bible. Those are the books that Moses wrote. Right? They were inspired by God, but Moses wrote them down. So Deuteronomy chapter 6. And let me tell you before we start looking at the scripture a little bit about this. So everybody remember a guy named Moses? You remember him? The guy I'm talking about? So Moses is a pretty main player, right? He's a, he's a big boy. We're coming to a place in Deuteronomy where Moses has led the Israelites out of the Exodus. So he, he has taken them out of Egypt. He's led them um, into, he's about to lead them into the promised land. He's actually at the Jordan. We know that Joshua is going to take them and lead them through the Jordan. But Moses is standing there as a leader who has been with them through an innumerable amount of trials. So remember they spent 40 days to get, or 40 years together um, wandering around uh, in the desert. And Moses was their leader. He was their pastor, right? So he spent these 40 years with these people trying to lead them to a new land. He's seen them disobey God. He's seen them obey God. He's seen them fall flat on their faces. He's, he's kind of, in a sense, been like, I've gotten to be two different churches, like a pastor is. I mean, you see the people get married. You see the people get divorced. You see the people baptize their children. You see the people uh, disobey the church, leave the church, abandon the church. You see the people come back to the church. And so he's witnessed all of this with these people. And now Moses is about to go, my life is coming to an end. So church, I've been with you a long time. I'm thinking, what if I knew that I was going to die? And I'm like, guys, we've been through ups and downs, but I hate to tell you bad news. Actually, it would be pretty good news. I get to go to heaven, but you know what I'm saying. I hate to tell you the news. I'm dying. Now, if I knew that I was going to die and I'd spent 40 years with y'all wandering around in the desert... We knew each other that good. What would I want to tell you before I died? What would I say? I'd have all sorts of instructions, right? But the main instruction that I would say is make sure whatever you do, do not forget your relationship with the Lord, right? I mean, you would hope that's what I would say as your pastor. Do not forget the word of God. Do not forget that Jesus Christ loves you. That would be my last sermon, I promise you. Jesus Christ loves you. Read your Bibles. I'm out. Peace. <laughs> this is where Moses is. He's got an opportunity to tell the people what he wants to tell them before he dies. And God has given him this inspired word. And this is what we're looking at. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6. And one of the pieces of advice that he has is to families. And generation to generation passing down the word of God. And if I could tell you one thing, if I'm, if I'm about to kick the bucket, it would be make sure that not only you have a relationship with the Lord, but that you share that relationship with your children. 
Don't hog it. Don't think just because you have a relationship with Christ that it's automatically by osmosis, your kids are going to be great Christians. You have to be intentional about sharing your faith. And this is where, this is where we are today. Deuteronomy 6, verse 1 through 3. Let's check it out. Here's Moses. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy a long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So look at, look at verse 1. Look at what it says. It says, these are the command decrees and laws that the Lord directed me to teach you. So he's going, this is not Moses' advice on children. This is not Children 101 by Moses. This is from God. This is a message that God wants you to hear. He says, and you're about to cross over the Jordan, right? So they're about to go, you remember where they're going? They're, they're going to Canaan, right? They're going to what's called the promised land, but before they get there, they got to go through more hardships. And so Moses is saying, when you go through these things, and, and you're about to be distracted, he says, make sure that you are teaching your children about what happened in the past. Make sure that you teach your children where I brought you from. So don't just go into this and be like, okay, we got a face today. We're going to get through it. Remember what Jesus Christ, is what we need to remember, has done for us already and teach it to our children. So Moses is going, we came through a lot. Don't forget it. Share with your children what the Lord has done. So here's my question too if you're a parent. Have you ever shared your testimony with your children? Have you ever told your children how you came to know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, if you know him? Because a lot of parents haven't ever done that. They've never shared their faith with their kids. You see, do you remember what happened when Joshua crossed the, crossed the Jordan? Do you remember what God told him to do? He crossed the Jordan and he told him to set up 12 what? 12 cans of beer they just drank? Come on. I mean, what, what, what do you tell them? Set up 12 stones, right? That represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Why did he tell them to do that? Because he didn't want them to forget what God had brought them from. That God brought them through the Jordan and parted the rivers. And so he's saying, every time you see those 12 stones, I want you to remember your past and remember that I was faithful. And it also says, uh, every time your children pass those stones, I want them to remember what I've done. Couldn't you see it? You and your kids are crossing the, or, 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 or coming up on the shore of the Jordan, and, and, and you come to these 12 huge stones that are standing there, and your kids are like, Mom, Dad, what are those stones about? And you're like, well, that was when God brought us uh, out of slavery to the Egyptians. And he parted the Jordan and we walked through it. See, what I'm, what I'm saying to you is that God has brought a lot of you in here from, from places of shame and guilt and distress. And we need to be able to share that story with our kids. And, and, and not, be, not be afraid. Um, and, and he says, get this, he says that if you do this, You'll live a long life. If you follow God, you'll live a long life. You will enjoy a long life. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that everybody in here who follows Jesus is going to live to be 120? Probably not. But I think what that means is if you teach your children what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, they're going to have a much better life than they would if they didn't know him. So I was talking to a guy recently um, from Buncombe Street. And his daughter was about to graduate and go to college. And, uh, and I said, well, dude, you know, I got two daughters, so I'm like dreading the day when they leave the house. I'm actually dreading the day when they start dating, but I'm really dreading the day when they go to college and they leave the house. Some of you have just been through this. And I said, are you scared? Like, are you worried? I mean, surely you are. 
And he goes, you know what? He said, I'm not worried about her. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, you know, she's a good girl. She knows the Lord. She has the Holy Spirit. And she's going to make good decisions. You see, he wasn't worried about her future because he had spent time investing the gospel into her. See, the greatest gift that you can give your kids is to provide a pathway for them to come to know the Holy Spirit. Because you can't protect them, right? You can't ride in the car with them. You can't go on the date with them. You can't walk down the dark alley with them. But you know who can? Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ will be with your children wherever they go. It's why you should pray over them when you drop them off at school because the Holy Spirit is with them. So Moses is saying, make sure that you give your kids the greatest gift they could ever have, which is a pathway to come to know God. This is a teen study Bible. I was 14 years old. Our house had just burned down. I was in like major distress trying to figure out who I was as a teenager. I honestly felt so lost, so afraid. And I think my mama saw it in my eyes. You know how mamas just know how their kids are? Like they just look at them and be like, you shouldn't be dating that girl. I'm like, how did you know that? I'm mama, you know? Um, my mama gave me a gift. She gave me a Bible. Now, this isn't like a King James version of writeth. So it, it's, it's not. It's like, it's everyday language that I could actually understand. Like it has like pictures in here, which I kind of needed at 14. It talks about addiction. It talks about dating. Um, and, and et cetera. And you know what? I opened this Bible the day that she gave it to me. I was 14 years old and I started reading it. And did you know that I started reading the Bible every single day? And you know what? I never stopped reading the Bible every single day. I kept doing that the rest of my life when she gave me this. Like, and my mama couldn't give me salvation, but she could give me a pathway to salvation. So I don't know if you've ever given your child a Bible, but I want to ask you if you're a parent in here, I want to challenge you to think about that. Giving them a Bible that's actually kind of cool, you know? Like, don't just give them like a $6.50 leather Bible as their name on the front and think that's going to be like, wow. There's all sorts of Bibles out there. Give them a pathway to come to know Christ. Now look at what it says. It says in verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And what does that mean? So what Moses is saying is remember that we have a monotheistic God, that we have one God that we serve. That's what we need to teach our kids, that Jesus Christ is the only way. We are not universalists. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. There's one God, and this is what Moses says. There's one God, and listen to what he says about him. Here's, here's what you need to know. And he's speaking to the parents, right? He's speaking to this generation. He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Give God everything. He says, parents... You love God. You love God. Don't take your kids to church, drop them off, and come back and pick them up two hours later and say, y'all love God. He says, you love God. You see, but what our, what our kids need is they don't need our teaching, they need our example. So kids need to look at us and know that we love Jesus Christ. I, I remember growing up, my mama, she got up every morning at 4.30 and worked out with Beverly Clearly. Anybody remember her? I know it's old school. But she'd been there doing aerobics. And at 5.30, she showered, she went in the kitchen, she sat down at the counter, and you know what she did? She read her Bible. Every single day. I can remember it, like it's clear as day. Her sitting on a stool, she had her Bible out, she had her pencil, she was taking notes. You know, that meant more to me than any teaching she ever did to me. Seeing her live the life before she asked me to live the life. And it's saying, love God with all your heart, people. It's, it's not saying, it's not saying just, just, just give God a little bit. It's not saying, love God with your religion. It's saying, give him your relationship. Give him your whole heart, your whole soul. It means, be willing to die for him. It doesn't mean having a Sunday religion. Worship me on the Sabbath. It doesn't say that. Give me everything that you have, parents. And, and then, then, 
your kids will see how much you love Jesus and they'll follow. Verse 6, it says, these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Right? Impress them on your children. Verse 7, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Words that I use here, impress them on your children, literally means that we, uh, it's like engraving in a statue the word of God. So it's like engrave in your children the word of God. So, like you can't do that overnight, right? Like if you want to engrave something, it takes detail and it takes time and it takes practice and it takes an investment. I mean, we, we can't become faithful disciples overnight, neither can our children. A confirmation program can't do it. A youth program can't do it. It's a lifelong commitment by the parents in teaching their children what it means to love the Lord. He, he says some specific things there. He says, um, number one, he says, when you sit at home, teach your children about Jesus. So when do we sit at home and teach our kids about Jesus? I mean... I, don't, I mean, we never go, come to me, children, I want to teach you about Jesus tonight. We, we never do that, but I'll tell you one opportunity to teach your kids about Jesus is when you sit down at the dinner table. It's really, really hard to do that. Amen. We struggle with it. But sitting down every night, having a meal together, and using that opportunity to pray together, have a devotional, and share the Word of God. Maybe using as an opportunity to say, where did you see Jesus today? Ask the kids, where did you see Jesus today? And they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So you go, let me tell you where I saw Jesus today. Where did you see Jesus? When you sit down, in other words, when you're in your home, when you're having day-to-day -day conversations. It says, when you walk along the road, when you walk along the road, share the gospel with your kids. How do you do that? Well, in everyday opportunities, you just share with your kids the love of Jesus Christ. I'll give you an example. Um, Mekin asked me, she said, where does the sun come from? Well, that was a pretty hard question. So I thought a minute and I went, well, Mekin, the sun is a ball of gas and um, the earth revolves. No, I, I, I didn't do that. I just said, well, God made the sun. She's like, oh, that was a whole lot easier for me to say. God made it. See, they'll ask things like, maybe your kids will ask, well, Dad, how did you and Mom meet? And you'll be like, well, you know, there's 7.5 billion people in the world, and just by chance we ran into each other. No, no. God brought us together. See, there's 7.5 billion people in the world, but God knew what he was doing when he brought us together. I promise you. So there's opportunities like that when you walk along the road just to share what God's doing. And then it says, when you sit down, um, or when you lie down, and when you get up. So what does that mean? It means that at night when you go to bed, you pray with your kids. You pray with them. I mean, it's really not that hard of a thing. Like, let's do some extemporaneous prayers. Let's not do just the now lay me down to sleep, or pray the Lord, my soul to keep. I'm going to die tonight, so help me get to know Jesus. You know? I mean, that was the one I used to do. Um, but just think about just saying, let's just talk to God for a minute together and let's talk about, let's just tell him how our day went and who in your class do you need to pray for and who do you know that's struggling? And, and they'll do it. I, last night, it was unbelievable. I sat down with Mika and, and, and Griffin was going to bed and we were trying to rock her and read Brown Bear, Brown Bear, what do you see? And, um, and I said to Mika, and I said, can you pray for Griff before we, before we go to bed? And I totally thought she was going to be like, No. But she just starts, she goes, Our Father, who art in heaven. And I'm thinking, whoa. Um, and she goes, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. She finishes it. I'm like, dang, girl. So where you been hanging out? Bochum Street. <laughs> um, but I mean, it was like, it, 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 was, it was crazy that she could do that and she prayed for her sister. And, and it's like when you... You know, when you lay them down at night, you just get in that practice. We say that prayer every night. Sometimes you don't know what she's picking up on. And then it says when you get up. And so what does it mean when you get up? Well, that's what my mama did. She just got up and she spent time with God before she got stressed out about all the stuff that was happening in her day. So we teach our kids, just wake up, read a little scripture. It doesn't have to be long. And 
and spend a little bit of time in prayer to the Lord. It, it finishes out in verses 8 and 9. It says, Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. <laughs> Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, I'm not going to ask you to actually tie scriptures on your children's head and hands. Um, and I'm not even saying you need to write the scriptures like on the door frames. I mean, I guess you could do that, but uh, or your gates. But I, I think this is this is this is the deal. Um, as far as the door frames and gates are concerned, you know, um, a door frame is an entrance way into somewhere, and so is a gate. So what Moses is saying is, when people come into your home, they need to know that your home is a place of God. And so, when your kids come into your house, do they know that it's a safe haven? That's a place where the Holy Spirit resides? And I can't tell you how to do that. I would encourage you to pray over your home together. Just pray over your house. Ask God to make it a safe haven for your children. Um, I would encourage you to write scripture somewhere in your house. Put a chalkboard up. Write a scripture on it each day. Challenge your kids to, to memorize it. I mean, give them a brownie if they memorize it, Right? Let the scriptures be evident. Let the Holy Spirit be evident in your home. I can't tell you how to do it. It's different for everybody. Pray together as couples. Read your Bible together. Teach them about Jesus Christ and the Word. So I've thrown a lot at you, right? But here's the deal. I hope that what you witnessed today when you saw this infant baptism, that you recognize that this is a responsibility of the parents, but also that if you're here today and you're sitting in these seats, I want you to know this, that you have a responsibility too. All the stuff that I'm talking about, yeah, we can take this and do it in our homes, but the parents can't do it without you. And so the reason that you're here today and the reason we make this vow together today is that we're all saying every single child that's sitting in the seats today, we're going to help raise them in Jesus Christ. That's who we are as a church. Nobody in here is doing it by themselves. Everybody's in this together. Everything that we do, and I want you to understand that if you're sitting in the seat and you've never poured into a child in the church, I want to encourage you to do that. Because this is the day. And here's the deal. If you're here and you're a mom today, and you're like, you know what? Mother's Day just really, really, really is not a good day for me. Let me tell you something. There's probably a kid sitting in the seat today who's thinking the same thing. That I maybe don't have a mom, that my mom's not good to me, that I've come to this church because I'm trying to find a place where I have hope. And I'm asking you today on this Mother's Day to think outside the box and to realize that you need to maybe make a commitment to help raise these kids in the Lord because they need a different chance than you had. And I want to put this bug in your ear and I'm going to do it every sermon during the series. I want you to think about the child outside of this church who doesn't have somebody to sit at home with them, to lie down with them, to walk along the road with them. And can we as a church reach out to our other children in the world who don't have somebody and maybe be a parent to them? So I, I want to challenge you that. In, in a minute, we're going to have a prayer time, but, but here's the thing that I want to say to you today. Wherever you are in here, wherever you are, you have a responsibility if you're an adult, and it's to help raise this generation, this generation of kids. It's all of our job. Every children's program, every confirmation program, it's all of us. And so I know you might be here today and you might have baggage. You might say, I'm hurt today and I'm a mom. You might say, I'm blessed today and I'm a mom. You might say, you know what? I've heard a message today. I keep hearing that maybe I need to consider fostering. I need to consider adopting. I need to pour more time into my kids. I don't know what message you're hearing. That's up to the Holy Spirit, not me. But I want you to know this. We're intentional today about we're going to have prayer teams for you. For the rest of the service, we'll have, I don't know, 10, 15 more minutes of the service. We have people who have volunteered to pray for you. There are people who have promised to keep confidentiality. We met last night and we did some prayer training. You'll see them. They'll be wearing buttons. They'll be at different places beside our communion stations. And I want you to take a risk and go and be prayed over. Mamas be prayed over. Daughters be prayed over. Somebody who's considering the process of adoption or fostering be prayed over. Somebody who feels convicted about serving in the church with the kids be prayed over. Now, we're going to get what we do this every week, Right? That's the goal, but I want you to take a chance today and let somebody pray for you. Because the Lord just put on my heart that today was going to be a day of emotion. Like, I don't know what message you heard. I was just faithful to deliver the one that he gave me. I'm just the mailman. But you might need prayer today, and we're going to have people to pray for you. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to take a step of faith and let them pray over you. Don't let these prayer ministers stand here and just look and be like, man, these people don't ever get prayed for, do they? 
Now they want, they want to pray with you. That's why they're here. And that's why you're here. Uh, because we're a family. So we're going to take a minute. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask him to bless this time. Precious Father, I know that you've given us this grand responsibility of raising children. And I, Lord, it is a, um, a daunting task to say the least. But I want to ask you right now, Father, as we open up this time of prayer, Jesus, I pray that tears come, that emotions come, that people that need to let down their walls are able to do that when, when they come to these prayer partners. I pray, Jesus, for the mom who's here today and just says, I am struggling. My kids are, are, are wearing me out. I'm worn thin. I want to pray for the person here who has struggles having children. Um, the person who just feels like you've abandoned them. I want to pray for the couple here who's been talking about adoption and fostering. Um, I want to pray, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to pray for someone who says, you know what? Man, I, I've got these kids, but I'm not teaching them about the love of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you meet each person where they are today. I pray that the Holy Spirit intervene. Father, I'm reminded that it's the story of the gospel that forgives us of our mistakes. And that when we preach the gospel, share the gospel, exemplify the gospel to our children, that we always remember that we are broken and we remind them. The only reason that I'm a parent is because of God's grace. Um, so I pray that if someone's here and they're feeling that burden, that they're just not good enough, remind them of your death on the cross, Jesus. Remind them of your resurrection. Remind them of second chances. Uh, as we get ready to receive this bread and the gift of the Lord's Supper, God, I ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit. Make it be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.